Back in 2006, someone in Toyota came up with the brilliant idea that after 40 years, people driving the Corollas are old and uncool, and therefore something new is needed. That something was called the Auris, and it came as a hatchback, as did the Corolla, or as an estate, as also did the Corolla. The Corolla remained only in sedan form and was targeted at Eastern European men with moustaches who think limousines are for real men and hatchbacks are for boys in skinny jeans and their girlfriends. Two generations later, someone in Toyota came up with a brilliant idea that since Corolla remained Corolla in some markets regardless of body style and since the model is something of a household name, perhaps it would make sense to stick with it. This is the brand completely new Toyota Aur Corolla. A Corolla Touring Sports, which means an estate. Let's talk looks. Brown paint aside, yes, it's brown, but it looks black in low light and violet in sunlight. The Corolla is something of an evolution of the Auris and the Avensis. Corolla Touring Sports has longer wheelbase than the hatchback and it replaces the Avensis estate. Clients interested in large sedans can finally put their money where their mouth is and get a Camry or a Corolla sedan. To simplify, the Corolla hatchback has 264 cm wheelbase, which is 4 cm longer than the Auris, regardless of the body style. The Corolla Touring Sports and the sedan have 270 cm wheelbase, which is like the old Corolla sedan and the Avensis. More legroom but without shelling out big bucks for the Lexus badge and that's a Camry with 282 and a half centimeters wheelbase. <sighs> Let's look inside the boot. The tailgate opens electrically and there's even a hands-free option as well. And like on the RAV4, the opening takes ages and closing takes even longer, 7 and 10 seconds to be exact. Under the RAV4 review, someone suggested that you could open the tailgate using the key fob even uh, if it's locked all you have to do is hold the key a bit longer so i'll just lock the car now is it locked yes i think it is locked and now i shall long press the tailgate button and nothing is happening nothing at all The boot has 581 liters capacity, 15 liters more, with a smaller engine. There's a double floor and you can stick the load cover underneath it. I like the LED lighting on the sides and I appreciate shopping bag hooks, a 12 volt socket and that the floor is reversible. Comes in handy when you have some dirty stuff to carry around. I wish there was a way to lock the floor open just in case I'd like to pack things underneath. There's a lot of space down here if you don't get the optional mini spare. There is also additional storage just behind the backrest, probably to cover the batteries, which are under the rear seat. The boot cover is massive and mounted quite high, which becomes apparent from the passenger compartment side. Perhaps it's partly to allow for vertical placement of carry-on luggage or because the hump is needed for the optional cargo net mechanism. The backrests split 4060. There is no ski latch, but at least there are release handles in the boot and the backrests are spring loaded. So it's easy to fold them from here, fold the seats and you get 1606 liters. Now there are two buttons on the tailgate. One is to close the tailgate. The other one also locks it. And why couldn't they add it in the RAV4? Back in 2012, when the second generation Auris was introduced, Toyota boasted the new model is ready for hybrid drivetrain without sacrificing boot space or passenger space, thanks to packaging the batteries under the rear seat. The same thing here, at least at first glance. But when you try to get inside, the car seems very low. I wasn't the only passenger traveling in the back, also shorter passengers complained the roofline is too low. Perhaps it's not the low roofline, but the high seat. Once inside, headroom is fine-ish for me. I'm 175 centimeters tall. However, if you plan to carry adults back here, they may be cramped on longer journeys. That said, the seats are very comfortable, despite the actual seat being rather short. And I'd like more foot space 
under the front seat, especially if taller people sit in the front. There are air vents, but there is no 12 volt socket or no USB ports. The door pockets are small, just for half a liter bottle and that's it. And there are also two cup holders here under the armrest. There are also Isofix anchor points on the side seats. If you go for the dark upholstery, rear seats can be heated. For some reason, at least in Poland, this light leather upholstery only gets front heated seats. There is not much headroom in the front. The seat is in its lowest position, hence the foot space is tight for passengers in the back. But the seats are very comfortable. After more than seven hours behind the wheel, my back didn't hurt. Depending on the trim, the dashboard can be partly digital or fully analog. This is a top trim model with analog gauges on the sides and a digital display in the middle. It shows the speed as well as trip computer information, driver aid settings, hybrid system status, etc. Higher trim levels may also get an HUD which shows the speed, hybrid system status, speed limits and sat-nav directions. Speaking of sat-nav, it's better than in the older Toyota models, but like in the RAV4 also here, you can't change the view of the map on the home screen, want 3D, full screen only. And I like that there are physical buttons, but why are they so small? The same goes for the AC. There are large temperature controls, but then there are tiny buttons here on the bottom. Apple CarPlay or Android Auto? Not yet. There's also not much space for your bits and bobs. There is an induction charger at the bottom of the console, but there's nowhere else to put other stuff like your sunglasses because there is no storage here. So there's an average size storage under the armrest and an average size glove box right next to the USB port, which seems like an afterthought because it's right around the passenger's knee. I have no clue how did Toyota Corolla get five stars on Euro NCAP crash tests with this. Perhaps someone didn't notice. To be honest, I didn't notice it either because it's just so low. I noticed it only when I had the camera on a very low tripod setting and then I found this. Maybe they should rerun the tests. One thing I hear a lot is the creaking caused by the seat rubbing on the armrest. It happens only in my driving position. Slide the seat back or forth a few centimeters and the problem disappears. However, it should not happen at all, not at all in a new car. Up to about 110 kilometers per hour, it's okay inside, but go faster and it gets noticeably louder to a point where you have to turn up your podcasts and speak louder with the passenger and better give the passenger in the back a shout to get his or her attention. The noise is partly from the engine and partly from the wind and tires. At lower speeds, there is a clear difference between when the car is in EV mode and when the petrol engine kicks in. Toyota's hybrid drivetrain combines a petrol engine with an electric motor to ensure optimum performance. Excess energy from the engine as well as some kinetic energy is stored in the battery under the back seat. This energy is then used to help the petrol engine when it uses the most fuel, like for example when taking off or under hard acceleration. Under certain conditions, in certain situations, like when coasting or driving at a very steady speed, you can go in electric mode only. but for short distances. The new Corolla comes with a choice of two hybrid drivetrains. One is known from the fourth generation Prius, that's a 1.8 liter engine and total power output is 122 horsepower. And then there's the hybrid dynamic force drivetrain with a 2 liter engine and a total power output of 180 horsepower. The former is aimed more at economy and the latter is supposed to ensure better dynamics. And indeed, even with passengers on board and luggage, the Corolla copes well enough when overtaking. You don't even need to put it in sports mode. I'm also not a fan of the eco mode because besides very slow traffic, it just cuts too much power. Otherwise, the Corolla is okay to drive 
it's not a sporty car and it doesn't pretend to be one. The suspension is comfortable, the damping is good, visibility all around is very good as well. Fuel economy is a different story. I drove the Corolla on the same route as I did the Mercedes-Benz B-Class 200D the other week and I barely managed to keep it at around 6 liters per 100 kilometers. The diesel was more economical even at higher speed. Sure, Toyota never claimed the hybrid is the best solution when you do a lot of motorway miles, but now you don't have the option of a diesel. You just have two hybrids and a 1.2 turbo petrol engine to choose from. The Toyota Corolla comes packed with standard safety features and driver aids. Only a few things are optional or available only on the highest trim models like the ICS, blind spot monitoring or cross traffic warning. We'll talk about ICS in a moment. Adaptive cruise control is standard regardless of the trim. I like that the system lets me know it detected a car in front and I have time to turn on the indicator and change lane before the system starts decelerating. And what's that ICS business? ICS stands for Intelligence Clearance Sonar, which may mean nothing to you. It's a system which works beyond the scope of the parking sensors. As you reverse closer and closer to an obstacle, you reach a constant beep point. But there is still some space left, and the ICS will stop you when there is really no more space. The other day I was reversing into a tight spot looking at the curb in the side mirror and I would have hit the car parked behind, but the ICS stopped me and saved me and the other car owner a lot of trouble. Toyota Corolla Touring Sports prices start at €22,200 for a 1.2 litre turbo petrol with a manual gearbox. This top spec model with a 180 horsepower hybrid powertrain and options cost around €38,000. A more powerful Kia Pro Seed is about 5 grand cheaper. A 1.5 TSI 150 horsepower VW Golf variant costs about the same, but it doesn't have Corolla performance. The Toyota Corolla Touring Sport is a decent car for decent people. It won't get your pulse racing, but that's what Italian sports cars are for, not Japanese family haulers. And how do you like the new Corolla? Let me know in the comment section below. Subscribe, rate and share. Join me for new reviews every Friday. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.